Right. And we are live here with Talking Tough. And guys, something just struck me. I am the fourth best looking bald guy on this <laughs> telecom. And no, uh, <laughs> I don't flatter myself. You're right. Well, five after our guest comes on. I already know that, but that's all right, man. Um, Sean, you're you're looking rather dapper in your uh, the Raiders Nation uh, gear. Feel like, you feel like a winner, man. We're back. We found out a way to win with a new coach, and uh, could be the start of something big. And I got to be ready when they call me up to to visit at the uh, Death Star in Las Vegas. I just came back from there. Got me a nice little jacket. So I'm representing. Is it leather? Hmm? What is it? It looks. Is it leather? Well, what else would it be, boss? I mean, you think it's pleather? I don't know. But it's, it's kind of <laughs> That's what I would have said. Oh, it's leather, man. Got the hoodie on. I'm ready to go. I'm ready for whatever kind of weather. I just put a helmet on this thing. I'm ready to play. That's some nice looking <laughs> swag, man. Bean, what does your shirt say? What does your shirt say? Legends, man. What is that? What's leg legend of what? Well, there's a, there's a guy that I met at the market. He, he had cancer and he lost a lot of body strength. He ended up working out his arms and he's like i think he holds the world's curl record right now wow. Wow. and that's his logo he goes by legend good for him man that's a good comeback i like those comebacks you know i i, I actually ran a marathon after uh i recovered from cancer 26.2 miles after my lug cancer recovery so I can't wow. far. Any, anything could be done right it can all be done yeah how often Bobby. do you run into a world record holder at the store of anything? <laughs> no, the sure. For sure enough. That's really cool. Yeah. Boss, what's That's going great. on with you, man? Nothing, man. Same old stuff. You know, like last week, it's like a, the, this Friday. The, the Monday, we start selling. So finally, this whole thing is going to start, man. Oh, I don't even want to talk about it because it's, 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 it's uh, bad. But I had some good workouts. I did some great things. You know, I felt great. I feel great. So uh, everything on that side is good. Healthy, uh, family's healthy. That's what it's all about, right? So uh, even when you're down with the money, it's all about health, health, health. And uh, thankfully, we have that. And my mom and dad, by the way, 60 years married yesterday. 60 years. So that's a diamond wedding. Crazy. That's how it is. Europe. Europeans stay, stay together a lot longer than Americans. But uh, I was in Vegas over the weekend. I ran into your boy Chuck Liddell. <laughs> oh, nice. They had a UFC fight. They had a UFC fight out there last week. Uh, I, I wasn't out there for that, but I I ran into him. I was at the Wynn Hotel, and um, I, I I stood back a little bit. I said, "So is everything okay in your universe, bro? You do, you doing okay? You've been in the news lately." And he says, "No, man, I'm good. Everything's good. Everything's happening for a reason." So I didn't want to get into his personal stuff because you get in the news and you only get bits and pieces of the story. But he was in a happy place because he's. You know, there's a mixed martial arts fight that weekend. I don't want to ruin it for him by talking about all that stuff. Yeah, that, but the they can see do it with, with, with the people, you know, because immediately when he said, oh, he was uh, in prison for, you know, uh, domestic violence, people already start judging, you know. Yeah. And I go, whoa, 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 whoa. And I know Chuck. I, he's yeah. not, that's that's not Chuck, you know. And well, sure enough, it was the other way around, you know. So, he, yeah, yeah he's he, he fought for the divorce. So that tells you a lot about that story. Yeah. Yeah, I just, uh, boss, I just talked to Chuck. He was the last person I talked to before we got on the air here tonight. Oh, and uh, yeah. I'm helping my uh, my friend, Sean. You, you might know him. He's the guy that has the autograph company. I think you've all signed for him at one time or another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, he's throwing a big birthday party in his backyard in San Diego, and he hired, hired Uncle Cracker to play. <laughs> and he's got, a big, he's got a big wrestling show, and the main event is a 10-man tag team match, and Chuck's going to be in it. Oh, so, uh, yeah. Yeah. Just to him, uh, in a backyard wrestling match in San Diego a couple weeks from now. That'll oh, be I love it. Yeah, he sounded good, good, actually. He sounded, as, as Sean is saying, he sounds good. <laughs> Look what I just came out with, boys. I know it's another little commercial plug, but I've been working on my Mutant All-In pre-workout, and now it also comes in, instead of just a, uh, a scooper, it actually comes in these cute little packets. You know, you just open it up, tear it off. Pour it in. Easy to carry with you. You know, you don't have to carry around the whole jug. So nice uh, little portal ones. I am mutant.com. A little selfish blood. Pre-workouts are coming your way. What is it, Sean? It's a pre-workout. Energy. 
I'm gonna send one to all you guys. And 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 there's Sean Ray with the shameless plug of the day. Although I have to say this, Sean, if, I'm gonna if you would send me if you would send me a kit, I'll help plug it. I'm gonna I, I, I'm gonna send all of you guys one. But at the end of the day, this is this is something new for me. It's a different wheelhouse. I've been a pitch man for many things, but I haven't actually had my fingerprints on stuff. So this feels good right. being with uh, yeah. with mutant that I can give my two cents and actually push something that I'm actually working with. So it's cool. Uh, that's that's beautiful. And you know, I was just I was just messing with you when I said yeah. you know the shameless plug. I've I've read and heard nothing but good things about your product, yes. and uh, I look forward to trying it myself. And, and I hear and I hear what you're saying. It's like the opportunity for me to do this with you guys. Yeah, we're all stars and legends in your fields. I mean, in my entire life, I've always been behind the scenes. So kind of my opportunity to do Sean in a way what you're talking about is yeah. take what you know and stuff out front with it. And yeah, be the quarterback. I different. Appreciate you, fine gentlemen. Well, as I know, Rick, we got an awesome guest tonight. Tell me about him. Yeah, man. You know what? Um, I, I'll I'll tell you a little bit about him, but I think I want to turn it over to Boss, who can probably provide the most most color. Um, Boss, I never told you this. For some reason, I, I've always thought that you and and our guest tonight, Sam Greco, were like the two biggest behind the scenes personality in the combat world. I've always believed that. So I've always thought of you guys kind of in that in that same frame. And uh, th this guy's from uh, he's from Australia. He is a legendary trainer. Hell, he trained Bob Sapp to win a kickboxing tournament. That could not have been easy. Uh, yeah. But uh, but apart from that, he himself is a world-class K-1 fighter. He beat everybody there was to beat. And, uh, boss, what, why, don't you bring, why don't you bring our guest on tonight? Can you do the intro? Um, you know, this is the thing. Like, the fighters that are uh, have a background in Kyokushin is something I did as well, and I, I never competed in it, so I'm not one of those tough guys because these tournaments that they have, it's crazy. It goes, it starts over 100 people, and it goes all the way down to, to, to one. You know, so it's it's over days. It's it's crazy. He, well, he competed in that, and he's really good at that. And he did a 50-man uh, kumite. So you're facing 50 guys, all black belts from Japan, and they don't want the gaijin, the, the foreigner, to lose, of course. And you have to face him at least two minutes. Or what they try to do, of course, knock out as many as you can, because otherwise 100 minutes of fighting with no breaks is uh, yeah. it's quite hard. You know, so for him to complete that, that is also insane. Then a kickboxing. I mean, the, the fighters that he had, all the Dutch and, and Andy Hook, and he was in that time that Peter Ernesto, who was Sam Shield, everybody was fighting Ray Sifu. I mean, those were the, the golden days of the K1. I mean, it was insanity at the time. So to have a guy like him on this show, who was an incredible badass, I mean, just the, the Kyokushin part, that says it all, but then have all these titles and all these accomplishments that he did after he fought Kikushin is just uh, amazing. And I'm very jealous of the 50-man Kumite because I always wanted to wrap up my career with something like that. But unfortunately, my injuries wouldn't allow me to. And I know because uh, it's going to take you at least half a year pre preparation to make everything numb. And you gotta you got to be in, in incredible shape. And then, of course, you're going to have to take into account that you're probably going to end up in a hospital for like two months or so, <laughs> six weeks or two months afterwards because... It's just the, the craziest thing ever. So, yeah, that is Sam. I went to visit him in, uh, in Australia also. He's toured me around there. He's a heck of a guy, man. Really good dude. So all the way from uh, Melbourne, Australia, here's Sam Greco. Sam. Hey, guys. How you doing? Boss. <laughs> how are you? Oh, man. Good Hi, man. Good the show. Hey. How are you doing, Sam? How's everything going? I'm, I'm really... Really good, really good. Considering what's happening around the world, I'm doing really good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me on, guys. And you're, uh, you look, you look great, man. Um, so the, the, the rumors of your early demise were obviously false. Here you are, looking good and strong. Oh, uh, you know, In life, I have a motto in life, and you, know, when you hear often people say never give up. I'm a true meaning behind that. I just never give up. I always, this is the way I've been brought up. My dad was exactly the same. You know, his grandfather was exactly the same. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And I just refused to give up in life. And I try to fulfill everything every single day and every single moment. Yeah, I know, I know you've been through a lot of tough stuff. And hopefully we'll have a chance to get to some of that. And I know that's where the never give up comes from. Is that like a natural thing for you? Or is it, uh, is it really take everything you have to get up and face stuff down? No, look... I I think it was something that I, that I learned early in the piece of my career 
Um, you know, I'm in a sport that's competitive and no one likes to come second. Everyone likes to come first. And unfortunately, that's translated into life and also in business. So, you know, that never give up attitude has just been instilled by me, by my parents, you know, and my fellow instructors over the years and, and also uh, training partners. And as, as the days go on, it tends to build stronger and stronger and stronger. And I'm not talking about just from a physical point of view. I'm talking about from a mental point of view. A lot of people tend to train physically and forget the psychology and the mental side of it, which is probably most important because physically we all break down. But your mental fortitude has got to take you to the next level, and that's where I sort of train my my piece. So I want to um, I want to ask you for a word of wisdom this early on in the show here. So I'm sure you've come across people in the gym before or anywhere in life that are probably facing something that's really hard. And let's say they didn't grow up like you did, being, you know, part, they're, they're not trained to overcome things and they're standing in front of you crumbling and you can see it happen. Is there anything you would tell a person like that? Yeah, look, I think the first things first is one of the biggest questions I ask people who fall in that category, and it's probably something I can ask you four guys right now, is if I actually said to you guys, who actually are you? Who do you represent? you probably wouldn't be able to answer me straight off, right? It's one of those things that you need to think about because it comes with a self-belief, right? And adapting that self-belief doesn't come overnight. It progressively happens each and every minute of the day, into days, into weeks, into months, into years, and so on. So one of the biggest things, I always go back to the rule basic, and I say to the individual, who exactly are you? Who do you represent? Who do you actually want to be? You know, a lot of people... It's quite interesting. It's like, you know, if I ask someone, they said, oh, I want to be like Bass Rutten. I turn around and say, well, that position's already taken. Who do you actually really want to be? Sam, one of my responses has always you know, been, I, so, I, I, I've always said that I'm, I'm a part of everybody I've met. I mean, all of my major influences, I mean, I'm a copycat. Somewhere in there, I shine, but I'm a lot of my influences, the people that I respect and admire, and I just take a little bit from all these different people, and I... I try to find my way in there, but I, I've already said I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm everything uh, that I've met. All the people that I respect and admire, I, I steal a little bit from them. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think, I think that's absolutely awesome that we can take little bits and pieces, but we create such a unique mold of ourselves and we try and be the best versions of ourselves every single day. That's all that matters. It's not about me beating you. It's about me beating myself. That's my biggest fear and my biggest competition is always the individual that you're looking at in the mirror, yep. first and foremost. You know, fear is like a seed. The moment it plants, if you keep nourishing it every single day and you allow it to grow, it's going to be overwhelming and take over. The idea sometimes is you've got to face fear head on. You've got to understand what you're dealing with. And if you don't understand, ask. Unfortunately, there's people out there that are embarrassed have got too much of an ego to ask and then when they do fail they can't get back up i'm one of those people who's always asked i'm like sean i'll ask i'll have a look i'll grab small little bits and pieces and i try to create my own that's all i do so over the years that's you know to answer your question it encompasses a lot of things yeah. you know to help an individual but at the end of the day as i say to those individuals i'm not behind you I'm beside you. We're going to war together. I'm going to help you get there, whatever it takes. Don't worry about where we start. Worry about where you're going to finish. So, yeah. That's great. That's great advice. Thank you. Sam, I asked you guys last week, have you ever been knocked out before? No, I can't. Yeah, so, to answer your question, the two parts of that question is, have I ever been knocked out cold? I've never been knocked out cold with the eyes closed. I think in 147 fights, Never been knocked out cold. Have I been knocked down and got back up? Hell yeah. yeah. Hell yeah. And you know something, as, much, as bad as it sounds, I'm so glad I did because it put a lot of things in perspective. I, I want to ask you about the you know? Kumite. I, I've, um, I always thought I was pretty knowledgeable about the fight world. And I have to say, boss, until you were talking about that a couple of minutes ago, I always thought the Kumite was a fictional thing. So I'm like trying to wrap my mind around what this is all about. And you're fighting like 50 people in what period of time exactly? Well, you're fighting really over about a minute and a half each round to two minutes uh, with a one minute break in between or just it could be just an instant turnaround. 
But the whole mentality, the whole idea behind that is, as I said to you, it's physical training aspect, getting ready for that is one thing, but it's your mental fortitude that takes you through. Physically, you might get to the 20th fight and you're still, you're banged up and you're starting to fade off, but it's your mental fortitude that takes you to that next level. And then what happens is you've got to work smarter, not harder. You've got to pay, make people miss and make them pay. It's not about how, brute, you know, how, how strong you are. It's about how technical you are mentally and physically, you know? And do you know what? There is times throughout that committee, there is times throughout sparring, you know, when you're doing them back to back to back. It's, it's mentally testing, you know, and it's easy to give up. You know, it's very easy to give up. But try and find a reason why you should keep going rather than why you should give up, you know? And it comes with the training. It, yeah, it comes with training. I, I don't care what anyone says. For me personally, and I, and I pledge this in all my talks around the world, is that training for me in my career wasn't about just the fighting. It's actually given me a lease in life outside the fight world. I still treat things the same. I still train the same. I still have the same mentality because that's what drives me through with family, friends, business, and everything else. I still implement all those good things. Sam, I'm not familiar with that style of fighting. Are you wearing like your boss hat on, the short and just the gloves? No, bare you, no, no. So it's a bit. It's it's bare knuckle, bare knuckle fighting. Yeah. You not wearing any protective gear, bar if you want to wear a groin guard and a mouth guard. You can kick to the head as hard as you want, knee to the head. You can't physically punch to the face, but you can punch to the body as hard as you want. It, look, it's grueling. It's testing. It's it's like the elite side of bare knuckle uh, competition, but it actually puts a stamp on you. You know, in life, it actually puts a stamp on you. It's it's not even so much about whether you're a black belt, whether you're a purple. It doesn't really matter. It's completing that uh, kumite type of fighting, whether it be twenty, thirty, or forty, or fifty fights. I have some friends of mine who have completed a hundred. Right. You know. Um, my a very good friend of mine here in Australia, Judd Reed, Francesco Felix has completed all 100. So those guys there, 50 is nothing compared when you go 100, <laughs> you know? Yeah, but it's grueling. I, I think that, you know, if you, because we, we were talking about him one time and he says, and I, I, I told you I want, would like to wrap it up and he says, go for 100, you said. He says, because after 30 fights, it doesn't matter anymore. You're so banged up and the adrenaline kicks in and you just fight on automatic pilot. And it was something maybe that you wanted to choose as well. Could have done. Yeah. Yeah, look, you, you do go in automatic you do go in automatic pilot and that's a given. Um, your body does become numb. And yeah. it's just those small trains of thought that'll take you take you through. But it's testing. Um, I'm just trying to think of the word that, that really explains it. Uh, yeah, it won't come to me right now, but no, you're right in what you're saying. Ben, you had won this. I was going to say, if Ben had fought, he could have been, body, could have been the king of the 33 rounder, man. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, sorry. sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, something like that. Sam, now, would you rather, do you enjoy training more, or did you try and, or did you enjoy fighting more? Because there's a lot she, of. Can I tell you something? It's a big accomplishment for you and them. You know, the, okay, I'll answer this by saying this. The hardest thing about the fight game was training. It was The fight was the easy bit. It was the training. The amount of hours you put in could have been 200 hours getting ready for a fight that could have lasted 10 seconds or yeah. 25 minutes. So to you me, know, the I'm hardest thing. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you misunderstood my question. I mean, would you rather, did you, do you enjoy training people to fight or did you enjoy fighting more? Um, I enjoyed the fighting more, but having said that, I really enjoy training people because of my knowledge and passing on knowledge to me. Knowledge is powerful. So watching someone develop and someone learn, to me, I most likely would say that it's a greater accomplishment than fighting, to be quite honest. You know, Watching yeah, people learn. I'm just the opposite, Sam. In, in, in bodybuilding for me, uh, I run into, because I performed at such a high level, my expectation of that bodybuilder was higher than sometimes they're willing to give. So for me, mm. helping, not coaching, helping was more, eroding, more uh, rewarding, but trying to actually coach someone 
there's so many things that you're self-reliant upon as a bodybuilder to, to eat at the right time, to, to rest at the right time, to train at a certain level, to go for the extra rep, do the drop sets, do the giant sets, do the abs, calves, do all the, the little stuff. I would expect that from the guy that's trying to be like me. And a lot of times they just, they didn't rise to that level of expectation. I would get frustrated because they're quitting in the gym. And that's not something I, that was never in my economy. When they quit in the gym, I'm 100% done. So I backed off mm -hmm. of trying to coach and then just tried to help because I had to really dumb it down with my mentality of like it's sink or swim, it's all or none, get out of the fucking way or, or do the sets or leave the gym. And that's kind of because that was my introduction from John Brown. John Brown kicked my ass in the gym. I quit many times. I threw up many times. I couldn't keep up. And he would embarrass me out the door. And then I had to come back in to redeem myself. But what I found is there's not a lot of people that can handle getting embarrassed publicly in a gym and come back and fight another day. They'll quit and they'll disappear. So I help instead of coach. I like the actual training myself towards Butterbean's question. Yeah, it, it's, it's, fun, it's funny you say that. We're just talking, I was having this conversation about, um, actually I was reading something on uh, one of the UFC coaches having a, a chat, I think it was West, having a chat to his, um, to his uh, female, uh, female, um, female fighter the other day and they said, I was a bit rough around the edges the way the coach, Coach was talking to uh, to the fighter when it came back to the corner. Look, as far as I'm concerned, I watched that fight. Everything the coach was saying was right, and the truth of the matter was he wasn't being rude. He was being he was being honest. He was being straight. She was losing every round, and he was telling her how to fix it, but she just wouldn't pull her finger out of her backside. So, yeah. you know, you, you're talking about you know you got even chased out the door by your coach, abuse and everything else. As long as it was constructive criticism, and he told you how to fix it. That's all that matters. You know, you know? Sam, that's all that matters because I've seen a lot of people. Yeah. One of the damnest things I don't saw, and I want to question you about what you're exactly on this. I was in Korea with a couple of my fighters when you were coaching Bob in that uh, eight man uh, K1 tournament, if you remember that. Yeah. And Bob won that tournament. I, I never in a million years predicted Bob Sapp would win a, would win three matches in one night to win a K1 tournament. And I, I'll say, Sam, that if you weren't there, literally screaming at him and and metaphorically and I hate to put it this way this is not a this is not a challenge this is an accolade if you were treating him like a child to my eyes he wouldn't have won one fight let alone three mm. so what what do you it was the craziest thing boss you should have seen this being I don't know if you guys yeah. ever saw this tape Sean it's worth watching that Bob wanted to quit in my mind every minute of that entire night and if it wasn't for Sam Greco in his corner pushing and killing him it wouldn't happen. Is that? Well, let, 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 Go on. I'll, I'll say. I'll, I'll say this. Um, I introduced Bob to K1 when we were wrestling over at WCW. After it folded, I took him over to K1. So I felt somewhat compelled as a, as a friend to sort of lead him into you know clear waters rather than murky waters. And one of the biggest things I said to Bob was you know because he was worried about not working and what is he going to do with himself. And I said, "Would you like to fight?" And when he said yes to me. His body said yes, but his heart said no. He was quite scared, you know, and I don't know whether people know that. But getting ready for that fight, um, one, of the, one of the biggest things was when he went over to Japan, I said, Bob, they're going to shower you with gifts. They'll end up spoiling you, right? And I knew that's exactly what happened. And when the Japanese couldn't deal with him anymore, they rang me up. They said, listen, we need you to come back and train this guy for these fights. So I gave him my conditions. And one of the conditions were that if we were to go over and fight for this tournament, Bob was not to stay in Japan. Bob was to come to Australia and, and train here. So what I did, I took Bob out of his comfort zone. He didn't like it at all. Didn't like it at all. But you know what? To get the best out of someone, you've got to pull the carpet out from under their feet. We're involved in a sport where I'm going to beat you. It's not the wrestling. It's not me and you versus the crowd. It's me versus you, full stop. So I thought for, in order for me to get the best out of him, I need to pull the carpet out from under him. I need to take away all these glamorous things that he's got, you know, within reason and put a training structure to get together because he was he was as strong as an ox talented but just lazy that's what he was and he got away with it for so long but um so i got back to australia and we did things that yeah we did things honestly that that he actually scared me at one stage his own strength and he just flipped one day sparring and i literally thought he hammer fisted one of the guys over the top 
the head. I thought he was going to pole drive him straight through, just went straight through the ring, and I had to pull him up. Bob's got some natural ability, but through his sheer laziness, that's where his problem lied. But we trained so hard for this fight, and one of the things that he was, he was fit, as opposed to all his other fights. He was actually fit, mentally and physically. And yet again, the biggest belief was within himself. No one knows this, and I'll tell you this on air now, but most of the fights, even in Japan, that Bob fought, two hours before the event, I was in his room. Why? Trying to calm him down, because he didn't want to go out. He didn't want to fight. And that's... No, my case. Yeah, he it's just, it's just, it didn't want to fight. He was afraid of getting hurt. You know, he really was. But little did he know the talent that this guy possessed was unbelievable. But he was scared of his own shadow. You know, great entertainer, great spokesperson, can pretty much, you can put a camera on him today and he'll run it straight off. You know, whereas you know, I've got to study it and do everything else. He was just a natural. But when it came to fighting, there wasn't a chance. He just hated it. But when he trained hard and he got his mind right, Bob was fucking dangerous, very dangerous. Which is why I think some people only listen to one voice like you were talking about, Rick. Uh, he was hearing what Sam was saying and applying it. I mean, when I came up in bodybuilding, it was John Brown's voice that would, would make me respond. I mean, he'd say certain things and I would respond, but if it was someone else, I wouldn't always get up for that person trying to cheer me on. Uh, reminds me of kind of Mickey and Rocky, right? Stallone hears Mickey and, and he just goes to another level. And getting him out of his comfort zone, taking him out to Russia to come back, you know, and, and train him in a different way. <laughs> not not always still cheats. Yeah. You know what really but you, cool do you know what? Is, and that's so important. Sorry, go, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead, uh, Sam. I'll, I'll, no, I'll, <coughs> I, I, I was just saying, uh, you're talking about trainers and fighters or trainers and, and bodybuilders. Irrespective of what sport you're in, there has to be a vocal connection, ear to, ear to voice connection between both in order for it to work. You know, especially from the fight game and Bass will probably, Bass and Butterbean will, 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 will tell you this, is that when you're in the ring, irrespective of whether there's 10,000 people or 100,000 people, when your coach talks from the corner, you should be able to hear it crystal clear, irrespective. That's the connection. That's the connection you've got to have. Reminds me of Tyson and, uh, and Kevin Rooney. When Kevin Rooney was out of his corner, he was with the shit. I think Tyson was on the straight and narrow when he had Kevin Rooney at the beginning of his career. Yeah. You know what, what, the, what the, I just want to say what a badass fight was, it was Mike Bernardo, the fr I believe it was the first time he was fighting in K1. I was there because Peter was fighting as well. I just had a panga show, and he was fighting Andy Hoop, and he was getting yes. his ass kicked. And he came back to the corner, and I don't know what his trainer said to him, but he started, and you see him in the corner, and this is just, if you look this up, it's like a Rocky movie. He's like this in the corner. And the guy starts talking, he goes like this, he looks up, and then suddenly you see him go, yeah. Yeah, and he starts screaming, and then he comes and he wins. He beats freaking. He knocked him out. Yeah, I was that there was, that time. You see, and that yeah. was his coach doing that because otherwise, I don't think it would have pulled it out of him. But his coach completely thrown him back, and then yeah. he won by knockout. Uh, his coach, his coach is, his coach is very old school. I remember that fight quite clearly because I just finished fighting. I was watching it from the back, and. Uh, yeah, it really got the best out of him. And that's what coaches do. When you're down and out or, you know, when you're doing well, they make you do better. When, you, when you're not doing what you're told, they clip you behind the ear and make you pull your finger out of your ass. Um, they basically pretty much hold the remote, if that's, a, if, if that's the way you want to call it, you know? So he did an exceptional job. That's why I asked you, you know, what you enjoy more because a good coach makes a huge difference. It makes a massive difference. Makes a massive difference, and that's why. Is that what you do now, Sam? Are you are you it's, a, coach? a coach? Is not just yeah. I'm sorry. Say it again. Is that what you're doing now, Sam? Are you coaching people now? Is that your? Is that what you're doing? Yeah, yeah. I'm definitely, definitely. I've got a, I've got a few boys fighting in the UFC, and I've got others fighting in kickboxing, and uh, and so on. So yeah, and I, look, I'm enjoying it. Um, I'm one of those coaches. I'm a realist. I don't try and live my my you know my extended career through their eyes. I make sure they live theirs. You know, and whatever advice I give them is in the best best interest of themselves, not me. So um, I want to see these guys do well. To me, that's that alone is a victory. I try to create, this is going to sound, uh, sound a bit awkward, but it's not about creating world champion fighters. It's about creating world champion people. 
Yeah. Do, do you have the same, do you have the same thing, uh, Sam? You are more nervous when your fighter is fighting than when you would fight yourself. I always. Oh my that. god! Oh my god! <laughs> yeah, one hundred percent. You know, when when you fight yourself, you know yourself. Um, I've never gone into a fight, never been nervous, and it's that first minute you got to bite down in your mouth guard. Once you let go of the first punch, everything just calms down. It's all good, but it's that whole lead up that's a pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, Sam, there's this thing we do on uh, on Talking Tough that we call <coughs> war stories, where we just like to get into like some of the crazy stuff that we've seen and done and and been a part of uh, in, in our our journey in this crazy world. Is there like I'm sure you have a thousand, but is there one like in particular that you can just blow people away with? Uh, do you know, uh, it, it's I've I've got a couple, but one of the ones that sort of comes to mind straight off. It's actually a wrestling story. When I joined, uh, uh, when I was wrestling with WCW, I went over to Japan to wrestle in Japan. And um, I was doing a tag team with uh, Buscaris at the time, the masked Mexican. And um, so I went over there and we trained over there. And I was in peak, peak fitness. I, I did everything. I looked fantastic, did, did everything. And learned the whole concept of what wrestling was all about. And um, well, the main event that day, and my, one of my finish moves is off the top rope. I normally throw the guy into the turnbuckle, hit him with a back spinning kick off the rope. He feeds up from the middle, and I, I jump off to a crucifix off the top rope. And um, as you know in wrestling, once you start, you can't stop in between. You've got to let it flow. And uh, I threw the guy into the turnbuckle and hit him with a back spinning kick. He hit the ground. But when he fed up, he fed up too far in the center. And I thought, wow, and I'm on top of the rope thinking, I've got to hit him with a flying sidekick. You know, he's a bit too far away, but I'd opened up my hands. The crowd already popped, and the rules of wrestling, once you've got the crowd in your palm of your hand, you've got to keep going. So I thought to myself, quick thought, well, think, what am I going to do? Shall I get down the ropes here and do something else? No, you've got to go. And I launched myself as hard as I could, and I caught him flush. I didn't even pull it. I caught him flush. I dropped him, and when I landed, I didn't real. Or when I say I didn't realize, I did realize my knee snapped completely. It was just hanging there, and it was a false finish. So I, I rolled him up. The referee's called one, two. He's kicked out, and now I've got to get back to the corner. The crowd's going berserk. I've got to get back to the corner, tag my main man in to finish off the fight. So I crawled over. The crowd's popping. I get out of the ring. He goes in. I've still got to come back in and save him now. <laughs> so as I jump in the ring to save him, my leg gives way and I potato the guy straight in the jaw by accident, you know. He gets up, he kicks me straight in the ribs, knocks the wind out of me. I roll out of the ring, fall outside, and he kicks me again. I literally grab him. I'm telling him, I'm going, I busted my knee, I busted my knee. Anyway, he eventually gives me the last one, takes the complete air out of me, <laughs> right, completely. We go off and win the match. But the crowd's cheering on how brilliant this performance was. But no one realizes I've just broken my knee completely. End up having a reconstruction oh. after that. So that was really weird. I mean, and the rules of wrestling are if you're not dead, you keep going. So I implemented that. That surely came to uh, fruition straight away. So that was a really, really weird but exciting experience. <laughs> there's, that, uh, there's that fake pro wrestling stuff for you, right? Man, it's uh, it's not, it's dangerous, dangerous stuff. Oh, I, uh, yeah, but all the bumps, all the falls, the blood—they're all real. You know? Oh yeah, that's oh, it. Yeah. I, I was talking oh, on the show. I said my my first pro wrestling match, I broke a disc in my back. My second, I ruptured my eardrum. The third, I ruptured a, a, a <laughs> black, had a blind spot in my eye. My wife goes like, "Why don't you go back to real fighting? This is it, it's more. Uh, you never had this." <laughs> Very true. Very true. I just thought of something. Sean, I have to interrupt you because this is about you. Oh. I just realized, guys, the only person on the screen right now who has not had a pro wrestling match, to my knowledge at least, is Sean Ray. And I wrestled as a sophomore. I couldn't do it, guys. I, I, I Okay, so I'm kind of a high team <laughs> freak, okay? I'm wrestling this guy, and he's got me down on my back in front of all of my friends. And I'm watching, it's in slow motion. Boss, I know this probably never happened to you, but for me, it was in slow motion. I saw the sweat. <laughs> he the rest of his forehead. And he's pushing me down, and I'm about to be pinned. 
And all I'm looking at is this little ball of sweat and it's coming down and it hits me in the eye. And then the next one hits me on the mouth and the next one goes in there, I'm done. I just give up. <laughs> that was it. That was 1983. I was done. It was never 1982. I quit. That was it. Dude, guys, I think we need to come up with a pro wrestling gimmick for Sugar Sean Ray, and I think we need to get him into one match before it's all over. Oh, Sean, yeah. what do you think? Yeah, so, you know, I keep thinking about, I keep thinking that I, I got out of bodybuilding injury free, and the things that you guys do, there's no way you get out injury free. You can't. No, How do you get out? Was your knee your worst injury, uh, Sam? Was that the worst part? That injury, your knee? Uh, in terms, in terms of fight, fight injury, you mean? Yeah, from fight injury, blowing out my knee, broken my knuckles before, and my uh, I compressed my neck severely. But um, yeah, the knee's probably the worst. You know, it's too physical of a sport for me, Rick. I mean, mine's a show sport. It's I'm lucky to get out without any injuries because I know guys that have torn their pec, torn their yeah. bicep. You know, injured. A lot of bodybuilders have hip replacements towards the end, and knee replacements. I know Hope, uh, Lou Ferrigno had a double hip replacement. Ronnie Coleman. By the but grace most of God, heavy enough to get hurt most, most of the injuries that occur are an accumulation of training stuff that you actually do it's yeah. not the fight that really, you know people say oh it's the fight that hurt him it's not the fight it's the accumulation that we don't take into consideration every single day we go to war yeah. <clears throat> that's there. what we don't realize we always think about that that last one on the pedestal with the woman on that pedestal on that on that fine stage with the lights are on no it's all the those 200 hours i was talking about training it's all the knocks and you know, little knocks and, and, and scratches and everything else that you get, everything accumulates. And it's a wear and tear. Our bodies aren't designed for it. Yeah. Hey, Sam, hey, I want to ask you a couple of pro wrestling questions, if, if uh, you don't mind, about your WCW yeah. days. What, what, years, what year did you start at WCW? Uh, that was just after 2000, 2001. So that was yeah. in the just, height of, like, um, that was NWO, Hall and Nash. And yeah, the, yeah. The, uh, when the inmates were running the asylum over there, pretty much. Oh, uh, crazy. <laughs> what, what was your first day like? What was your welcome and reception like backstage? Uh, it was, uh, it was uh, well, first of all, it was uh, Paul Orndorff. The late Paul Orndorff who got me uh, interested in this uh, wrestling. I had a reason why I went across. Uh, I was coming out of contract with K1, but I sustained a severe injury over a period of time. I had a 10-centimeter hairline fracture fairly deep through my shin and I used to get a flex through my shin every time I'd kick so the medical department uh, my own medical department had a look at it and they said to me we need you to take a break otherwise you'll end up breaking your shin we're going to end up putting a rod through it you need to take time off at least six or six to twelve months and I thought just I can't do this I said I know I'm coming out of contract but I've got another contract coming up I said I can't and they said well it's up to you it's a gamble you're going to take so I um, spoke to family and, 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 and so on, and um, I came to the idea as, uh, you know what, I haven't had a break. I might as well. I want to preserve my body as much as I can, even though I was still sore, but I want to preserve as much as I, I couldn't bear the thought of having a rod running through my leg. So I went to see K1 and said, you know, I need, I need the time off, which they weren't happy about, being one of their key fighters and making their money as much as I make money, but they, they wanted me to continue on. Typical Japanese type scenario, us, you've got to keep going at, at all costs. Um, and only those who have gone through that will, ex will understand what I'm saying. But um, when I did decide to step away, I thought, you know, let me let me see what the wrestling's like. And I remember speaking to Paul Orndorff. He says, why don't you come over and, and trial? And that, that's exactly where I met Bob Sat. And we did the trials. And three days later, we got called in and we had a contract. You know, I, I, I was uh, I, I with Eric Bischoff and Eric Bischoff I got to cut you off for one second because Butterbean, Butterbean wrestled professionally. He knows what it's about. Yes, he did. Bumps. Bean. Yeah. So Sam needed a break and he needed time off and he went to pro wrestling. That was your answer? Yeah, I wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> I went to break from kicking people in the head. <laughs> yeah, man. Anyway, sorry, man. I just want to make sure I had that right. Okay. <laughs> well, for yeah. the timeline purpose, I mean, Sam, what are you, 54, 55? Yeah, 54 going on to 55. Okay, just so, and then, so what happens when you get backstage? Uh, Hulk Hogan, uh, Scott Hall, Kevin Nash, how these guys, Rick, uh, Scott and Rick Steiner, 
How do these guys treat you? Oh, I, I, I probably had more of a dealing with Rick Steiner and his brother than what I did with uh, the other, some of the other guys. But, do you know, it's quite interesting characters. Um, I admired wrestling since I was young. So I've always loved wrestling. I've always had this interest. And watching these guys work and at work was unbelievable, especially coming from a sport where I said to you before, it was me versus you. Now it's me and you versus a crowd, you know. Um, these guys knew the business. I mean, uh, spending time with Ric Flair, listening to Ric Flair coach or give advice was absolutely amazing. Paul Orndorff, exactly the same. They, the, they did a sit one day in the gym at the power plant we had four power plant they did this Paul Orndorff and Ric Flair honestly I thought it was real when I say I thought it was real these guys are going to kill each other but they, well, it wasn't it was just a work and the way they did it they just pulled it off so well that I was just blown away I was absolutely blown away so learning from these guys learning the business was the key element to being you know being a wrestler you can't just be a wrestler for the sake of knowing how to wrestle you've got to know the business full stop so yep. did anybody um did anybody test you backstage um, <laughs> it's funny, it's funny you say that. I, look, when I say test me, um, it, it took a long time for people to build trust in, in me because a lot of them thought that I was going to kick him in the head or punch him straight in the face. So anytime I said to someone, look, let me kick you, just, you know, just take the bump to sell it well, um, they used to pull away so far. It just took me forever. I used to get sore hips by the time I finished training from kicking. Um, and I remember Chronic doing a gig with Chronic when I, and they're, they're six foot four, six foot six, and I had to kick him in the head. And I said, I can pull it. I can literally pull it an inch away from your face. Just take a bump. That's what you need to do. But every time we kept trying, it kept pulling away and it made it look like shit. So I said, oh, you've got an option. You either do as I say, or otherwise I'm going to just let it go. Yep. And you've got yep. no choice but to take a bump. But I think he did the best he could for what it was worth. And I can understand on the other side, when you've got someone who's a crazy person or who's a former fighter sitting on one side and you're used to just taking a bump, it's, it's a trusting and that's the biggest thing that I had to build with all these guys. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. Okay, yeah. guys, this is a truly bizarre question and it's for Sean. Hey, guys, it's a total subject change, but I think everybody will get a kick out of this. Sean, we have a – there – is that it? Nope, it's a different one. Yes, that's it right there. Did your mom skate in the roller derby? <laughs> she was a, a T L A T bird back when she no was like way. Oh my God. 17 or something like that. I mean, I, I wasn't born. Um, but yeah, whoever brought that out of their ass. <laughs> <laughs> I might have said that once in my life, but yeah, she did it for a little bit. What a, that is so, dude, the, when I was a kid, Sean, growing up in LA, yeah. I would go to the Olympic Auditorium for two yeah. things, pro wrestling and the L.A. T-Birds. Yeah. And I love that stuff. Yeah, I'm like flipping yeah. out that Sean Ray's mother skated for the T-Birds. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I, mean, I, I imagine my mom skated for the T-Birds like my dad was on the L.A. Chargers. I think he might have been on the practice squad, but he was on the team. Um, yeah. And it was a different time, a different era. Obviously, I wasn't around. These are stories that my parents told me. But I, when I grew up and I found out what the L.A. T-Birds were, I thought my mom was kind of cool. It's, that's and, awesome. And like, like pro wrestling, man. That yeah. I mean, the, the outcome is predetermined, but the rest of it ain't no joke, man. They're yeah. uh, they're taking their bumps, no doubt. Yeah. Bean, did you ever think about skating in the roller derby? <laughs> no, I mean, the Red Wings. Red Wings tried to hire me as a as an enforcer one time, but I, I didn't. I wasn't really good on ice skates either. Yeah. Awesome. Did you ever finish your road trip? Or are you still on the road? Or last time we saw you, you were driving off into the sunset in your new uh, I, leave, I leave in the morning. We're going to Lexington, Kentucky. It's called a Scare Fest. Uh, it's going to be a three day show. I, I'm excited about it. the Scare Fest. They got everybody from Kane Otter to uh, who else is going to be there, love? In Kentucky. My buddy Kenny Rice lives there. Candy man. I mean, there's a lot of big scare fest type scare people that were in a lot of horror movies going to be there. It's going to be a cool show. Nice, nice. That, that sounds like hey, fun. Anyway, guys. first time this weekend, so I got to drive it home for ten hours, but now we get to sleep in it for the first time. Finally, nice, nice. nice. Hey, yeah, Sam, Bean has been on this quest 
Oh, boss, I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. No, no, no. I was. I, I, I just had this whole thing in my head for the whole time, and I'm just looking because I wrote it really fast down. It's like when Sean was talking about the slow motion with the sweat falling in his face. Yeah. I had an experience in this, I, but it was the other way around. So <laughs> I was chasing Jason to Lucia, and I said, you know what? I'm going to play with him for 10 minutes, and when they say 10 minutes pass, I'm going to knock him out, right? That was my game plan. But then around seven minutes or so, he makes a back fist, and he, ca he catches me with a back fist. And you see me doing this, and I see he's bleeding, and I don't know how big it is, so I immediately I drop him in a liver shot. So he goes down, and he gets up, and I hit him again, bam, bam, a liver kick, boom, and he goes down again. And I got to tell you, you know, he, he was very tough. He kept coming up, kept coming up, and then the final one was this big punch. This is where I snapped his liver, actually. And uh, it, I, I felt like I missed him, but it was because he was breathing in, you know, so I just slid through the whole freaking belly, and I thought, whoa, and then he went down. So he's an intense man. And he's on the ground and I try to be the nice guy so I'm walking over to him and I'm saying hey how are you doing and he's on the ground <laughs> and I see it slow motion the blood go straight into his mouth <laughs> and he's freaking out he's going oh! <laughs> he starts screaming dude it was like <laughs> right in the mouth oh, no. oh it's the funniest thing ever <laughs> Oh God! That's what I wanted to say, man. I would have quit, man. That's it. That's you know. I'm afraid of my mistakes, but sweat and blood, I can't do it. Oh, no. I don't think I don't think you're gonna like your new pro wrestling career very much, then. But I, I can watch it. I can't participate. In it, man. That's not my thing. So uh, Sam, who's who? When you were coming up, like who was the big wrestler out of Australia besides yourself? Like who was the wrestling guy? I'm not sure. Who represented Australia per se? I know like a lot of American talents, right? We have Hulk Hogan, The Rock, and all these people. Who came out of Australia? Who was the man? Oh God, who did we come out of Australia? I mean, we look look. We had our own locals here um, in Australia. I'm just trying to think of man. Um, Dominic Danucci. Uh, Dom, Dom yeah, Dominic Danucci was one. Yeah, yeah. But uh, are we talking about? Uh, are we talking about uh, the the Hulk Hogan status? type of yeah, guys in the crew. I, I really can't think of anyone. I, I really, off the top of my head, can't think of anyone. Like I said, for me, for me, predominantly, it's been the fight game. Wrestling was sort of the end, the end piece before I went into MMA, you know? Um, so, yeah. So, I really can't think of... Um, we had a lot of Australian greats, but not not at that level, you know? I just got that one big Australian guy um, in the UFC. Uh, you guys know who I'm talking about. It looks like he's Samoan. Um, I think it was. Bam, Bam. Who was it? Sorry, recently. No, you I, thought, I thought this was UFC it? fighter was like a heavyweight. I thought he won the championship uh, from Australia. Oh, you were thinking maybe Mark Hunt from New Zealand, yeah. possibly. Yeah, you know, Mark Hunt, yeah. Right. yeah and, uh, right, you have Robert Whitaker now, of course, fighting at the highest level in the U.S. Yeah, the highest level is probably Rob, Rob Whitaker. You got uh, then you obviously New Zealand is Israel Desanya. And then what, about so. what about in boxing? I saw uh, guy 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 guy. Um, Big Bob, Man. what's his name? He fought George Foreman. Bob Merovic? Yeah, yeah, he's a tough guy. Yeah, tough kid, tough kid, yeah. Okay. Yeah, he's he's well 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 retired now. Well retired. Uh, you had an Australian fighter beat um I think it was Manny Pacquiao, who I didn't think you beat, man. Yeah, that was Jeff Horn. I didn't think you beat Manny Pacquiao in the first fight. I don't know if they yeah. probably did. Do you know what? I'm very skeptical about today's judging and referee, uh, judging more than the referee, but uh, in most sports, even in UFC. I, sometimes was, I, yeah. I, wonder, I wonder what fight they're looking at, to be quite honest. Yeah, if you guys haven't yeah. seen the Pacquiao-Jeff Horn fight, you got to watch that. I thought Pacquiao yeah. got it. It's tough, yeah. It's then tough. Kostazu is a, is a boxer. Kostazu come from Australia. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Costa Zoo did. His son's doing extremely well. Wow, right so right now. His son just looks like a taller version of his dad, you know? Sam, before we wrap up for the day, now you sh I, I hope it's okay to share. Uh, I, I know you had some uh, some pretty big health challenges in the not too uh, recent past. Can you uh, fill us in? Yeah, look, it's, it's something that. Um, um, how can I put it? I, I suppose when it happens in family, it, it's quite um, 
it's quite heartbreaking, excuse the, the use the term. I mean, uh, my dad, uh, 25 years ago, I mean, I lost my dad six months ago, but 25 years ago, nearly 30 years ago, I should say, had some heart issues, uh, had some uh, artery blockages, and uh, they put stents uh, to open up those, uh, those arteries, and um, it didn't work on dad. So they ended up doing a bypass, but they did all five on his heart. So they opened him up and did all five. And he was brand new. You know, he lived it right through till about six months ago. Uh, and mind you, he didn't die because of his heart. He died because of a stroke. He had a really severe stroke, paralyzed him. And literally, uh, he was only alive for 24 hours and then he passed. But two years ago, um, I was coaching Jimmy Crute, one of the UFC boys, who currently UFC, um, Sorry, 2018, I was coaching him for a world title here in Australia. And um, I felt odd throughout the whole day. I was just feeling down and, you know, just lethargic. I was tired. I just wanted to sleep. I didn't want to be around people. And I, I remember sitting in my office all day and I'm thinking, what's wrong? And that night we had the fight. I'm thinking to myself, well, I've got to go home. I've got to pick up my medical bag because I forgot where I keep all our bandages and everything else. And... Um, I remember walking out and I grabbed this energy drink because I owned a restaurant at the time. I grabbed an energy drink out of the fridge. I don't drink energy drinks, but I thought I'd drink it just to try and pep me up. So I sculled this whole mother drink, went home, picked up the baggage, and my wife said to me, she goes, what's wrong? She, I said, oh, I just don't even want to go tonight. She goes, that's unlike you. And I said, yeah, I don't feel well. You know, I just feel drained. I think I'm overworked. And mind you, it's been a busy week. And I thought it might have been the build-up to this world title fight because as much as a fighter, a coach, takes everything in you know and has to process a lot so i thought it was all that just building up i remember going to the venue and wrapping his hands and as i'm wrapping his hands this is probably about a couple of hours before the event i started to get these really dull chest heaviness and i thought to myself wow what's wrong and i i was too embarrassed to actually say anything to my fighter not embarrassed more so i didn't want to detract his attention from what he was there to do so I didn't speak to anyone from our team, even though I'm the head coach. I just kept it to myself. And I remember holding pads for him. And over the years, when I've hold, held pads for him, when he hits the pads, I'm the one telling him to keep going. But this time, as, him hitting, as he's hitting pads, I said, oh, that'll do, you know? And he goes, you sure? I go, yeah, that'll do. I was just running out of breath. So I couldn't, I didn't realise what was happening. And um, I thought it was like a severe heartburn. Anyway, 10, 10 minutes before the event, we huddled up and I always give the boys and the team the blessing before we go out. And just as I finished doing that, something was saying to me, just say it, just speak up, Sam. And I thought, I can't do it. So we walked out and we walked out and he fought and between for five rounds, for five fives, I was holding my chest as I was coaching. Wow. My mouth was dry. And when we'd won the world title, I jumped in the cage and I said to him, look, we're going to go. And he goes, what's wrong? I go, look, I just got to go, I'm not, not well. So we went down the back and I'm sitting there, I'm sweating profusely and my mind's telling me, go home, rest, shower, just have a rest, you'll be fine by the morning. But my gut's telling me, get yourself to a hospital, you know? And I sat there and one of the guys come up, he goes, you're okay, Sam? And I looked up and I had my car keys in my hands and I threw them at him. I said, do me a favour. His name was Baker, I said, he's one of my students. I said, do me a favour, go grab my car. I said, right, take me straight to the hospital tonight now. And he goes, what's wrong? I said, just get me there. So we race off to the hospitals midnight on a Friday night. And I get there and sure enough, um, when I went straight in, and one of the biggest mistakes I made was driv driving myself in rather than get paramedics to take me in. Because once paramedics take you in, you go straight in. But when you drive yourself in, you've got to go through the whole formalities. What's your name? Do you have health care? Meanwhile, I'm dying here, you know. So anyway, by the time they, I, I went in, they wired me up and they just called everyone in and I was having a heart attack. That's what it was. And I had, they found I had a 99% blockage in one of my main arteries. So I went into surgery and they put a stent in my heart and they said, look, you should be fine. It, it's in a really tricky position, but we've done it. You'll be fine. And I went off and 15 months later, I'm back at training. I would say fit back at training. I was training before that. But at the 15-month mark, I'm rolling around doing a BJJ class. And I'm starting to get these heavy chest pains again. I'm thinking, what the hell's going on? And I was running short of breath. And one of the girls who was rolling with us was a nurse. And she says, what's wrong, Sam? And she goes, you look pale. I said, yeah. She goes, do you want to get an ambulance? I said, do me a favor, call an ambulance. 
So sure enough, they call an ambulance over and they check me out and he gives a code to his other his other paramedic and I said, can you cut the crap with the code? What's wrong? He goes, you're having a heart attack. I thought, oh shit, let's go. So I said, you've got to give me something for this pain because the pain was so excruciating. And um, it, it was during that time I thought to myself, Jesus, is my life going to end here? What, what's going to happen? All these thoughts go through your head and all the things Things that you think are important in life, everything that you guys do, every single one that you run around and say, oh, fuck, I've got to do this, I've got to do that, I've got to go here, I've got to go there, nothing's important. Nothing's important by your own health. Think of it. Oh, shit, we're losing. We're losing. Do we lose audio on, Sam? Yeah, I lost a little bit. One second. If it comes back, you should repeat the last one. Yeah, yeah. We're talking about health. Back. So, so, so I, I, um, where was I? No, no. Keep going for. Where was I, guys? You remember? Yeah. You, yeah. Uh, after you said okay. that, uh, you don't think about anything else. Yep. Yeah. So I don't think about anything else. Yeah. So I've gone in, and they checked me out again. They said, "Sam, you've had a reblockage. The same stent we put in. This is not looking good for you. Uh, we're going to check all your other arteries out." and we might have to do a bypass. And that was my biggest fear, is getting an open surgery, cutting me open, you know? Anyway, um, sure enough, I was faced with one of my biggest fears. They said, Sam, you've got to have a triple bypass. And I thought, oh, fuck, you know? My life's over, this is it. And it took me, honestly, it took me nearly a day to, uh, to get a grip of myself. And I thought to myself, you know what? There is a God up there. Thank God that he did choose me today because if he didn't, I would have been dead at home. And that was the truth. So I'm grateful. Yeah, I'm grateful. For, sorry. How long ago was this? Uh, so the July last year. So July last year is when I had the triple bypass. And it's a, it's a big surgery. They cut you open straight through here. They took an artery out of my arm, took an artery out of my leg and one out of my chest. So they did all three of them. And, um, you know, I was so determined. I was so determined to get back on track and not just prove to myself but prove to my kids and family that anything is achievable in life. You're just going to be able to stick to it. And that whole never give up. We're all faced with adversity. So I was faced with one of the biggest adversities of my life. You know, I had the choice of saying, that's it for me, no more. But hell, I've got too much. I've got too much to offer life. I've got too much to offer my kids, my family, my friends, you guys. So I'm around for a long time. And even though I had triple surgery, I walk around as if I haven't had anything. So um, if there's a lesson to be learned here, irrespective, it's what you make it. If you allow it to breed, and if you allow it to be bigger than you, well, then it's going to get the better of you. But if you don't, you'll beat it. So, so yeah, I went through all that. But just showing that anything's possible, guys, irrespective. I mean, I hope that none of you go through it. But if you ever did, God bless. I just go. You just got to keep going. But one thing it did do, and I, I say this, it put things in perspective, what's important and what's not. Yeah. Amen. Okay. Um, um, you say what's so a, year, a year and three months ago, and you look great. Uh, so Thank you. We, yeah. We haven't been there, uh, Sam, so we say what's important and what's not. So how, how did you come out of that and restructure or reprioritize? What, do, what did you pay more attention to? Because obviously getting healthy is one. Uh, you taking I in paid, yeah, I, 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 okay, I was one for the people, meaning I used to give people a lot of my time. When I say a lot of my time, probably too much and not give myself enough. You know, so it's, in other words, giving you a lot more loving and caring and not giving myself what, what, what I deserve. And that made me reevaluate things, spending a bit more time at home, you know, uh, treasuring the small things in life rather than the big things. Uh, time is something we'll never get back. Ever, you know, so uh, appreciating time, appreciating good people, you know, um, there's uh, appreciating family. I mean, I just lost my dad too. I mean, I, you're talking about, you, you really want to talk about, you know, uh, when things completely go wrong. I lost my dad seven months ago. I lost my father-in-law six months ago and I lost my uncle, my dad's brother, five months ago. So it was one month apart. So, you know, and life goes on. Life goes on. Life does not stop. Time just keeps going. Yeah, well, then you need a big yeah. osu to push it to endure, right? Oshi and Shinobu. Osu. That's what it means, yeah. to push and to endure. 
Yep, you got to, you got to, you, you've got to push through everything in life. Yeah, but you know what? It makes or breaks people, and that's the truth. And um, I've got friends that that will carry through, and I've got friends that that structurally look look strong, but mentally are weak. You know, and they're the ones you've got to put your arm around and say, "Come on, I'll lead, I'll, I'll lead the way for you. Let's go. I'll teach you." So where I can lend, where I can lend a hand, I will. I think it's interesting you say that because we're all like. 50 plus and i think we get that now like we're at that place we can't take it with us so giving it back and, and, and trying to share it and also paying attention to the things that we ignored as athletes because think about how much we ignore as athletes right and we ignore the pain right we ignore yeah. our family we ignore our friends we ignore a whole lot of stuff and then on the back end on the, we're on the back nine past 50 uh, there's all these things that we were ignoring that now we uh, consciously or subconsciously have got to pay more attention to because we ignore it for so long. I will say one thing, yeah. guys. Life is way uh -huh. too short. Life is way, way too short. So make sure you tell the people that you love that you love them every day. I love y'all too, every one of y'all. Love you, yeah, man. Yeah, right back at you, man. Yeah, right man. man. Y'all yeah. got good taste. Yeah, you're, you're, you're in the, the, old, <laughs> the old saying is, you're in, your old saying is you're in this world for a month. Remember that. So, so Sam, on a scale of one to ten, how get warm and fuzzy are you feeling in this group right now? <laughs> oh, man. Do you know what? I actually feel at home because of um, we've all got the same hairstyle, which is absolutely fantastic. So you guys have made – thank you for uh, leaving your wigs at home today. <laughs> Thanks for making me feel good. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I feel great. I feel great. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, man, it's really, really good to see you. Glad, glad to see you doing so well. Sorry, I've got to, I, I, I've got to say, I've got to say, hey, Butterbean, I was sitting ringside when Butterbean fought in Japan, and he, honest to God, and I'm going to say this, he threw a left hook, and he, he absolutely he missed Genki Sudo at one, one stage, but it was the gust of wind that came from behind that left hook. It would have taken, would have taken my hair off if that was the case. The guy hits like a truck. <laughs> and it, you know, and I, I've just got an experience on all of you, you know, and, and Bus Rooting himself, absolute nut. When I say nut, I say that respectfully. Um, he's a guy that, that I look up to, um, just his form of fighting, but just his mentality, his sheer persistence and his mentality. Um, you've had an influence in my life. Oh, wow. So Wait, I've told him that before. I'm going to tell you that again. And obviously, Rick, I, I, I met you and, and we've spoken about, you know, through the wrestling days and so on. So I appreciate you having me back here. Um, or we're going to say back here, allow me to come on your show. And Sean, I've been a bodybuilding enthusiast, not a bodybuilder myself, but a bodybuilding enthusiast. Well, I've got to say one thing. You guys are absolutely magical. And I say magical. Um, it's not like the fight game. Your biggest test is against yourself. Um, and it's quite a hard sport. And I come to understand it. And this is the way I, I look at it is when you guys are at your most uh, at your best physical condition is probably when you're most unhealthiest, meaning you're, you're in, in terms of your dry, depleted and everything else. So that's a whack sport too, man. And guys like yourself can do it. I, I definitely couldn't do it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, well, it's been an honor and a pleasure having you on here to hear the other side of the story, man. I mean, you've been through, you've been through it, but it looks like you made it through it. So we're glad to have you. Yeah, thank you. Wait on Australia to open back up again. Uh, we hope, uh, hope. Look, did, did you say when we open back up again? Yeah, we're, we're we're waiting for it. How how is how is it down there? Uh, well, look, Australia's been terrible. We've been one. Of, we're probably the the most locked down country uh, or state in the whole entire world. Tonight at eleven fifty nine, uh, it looks like we're going to open back up, but we're still restricted to what we can do. But hey, I think the world's going through it. Life's changed now. It's. Uh, you know, it's something we're going to have to live with, and that's all. But we don't stop. Life goes on. Cool. Yep, right. Exactly. Well, Butterbean, do you want to do you want to wrap up uh, our guest for uh, the week? Hey, I really appreciate you coming on. I really do. Uh, hey, stay tuned. And listen next week. Who do we got coming on next week, Rick? Well, you know what? We'll, we have we have Mick Foley next week. But once once Sam goes, I think the four of us stick around for a minute. Maybe we could talk about him a little bit. But um, yeah, we have Vic Foley next week. Hey, Sam, we really appreciate you coming on. We really do, and hopefully we'll do it again. 
Awesome, brother. Thank you very much, Us. Thank you very much, guys. Pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Thank you. Take care. Freaking awesome, bud. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great evening, my friend. What a sad. That, that was really cool, you guys. Boss, I was tripping out look, seeing you and Sam Greco on the screen together the whole time. Um, I actually uh, I actually even took a photo of it. I couldn't help it. But How uh, no, no, no. is it that you two never yeah. fought? You guys did well, it was different, different sports. Yeah. Uh, he was in the K1. I was fighting mixed martial arts at the time, at the yeah. same time. And, uh, and thankfully, because the guy did, he's a freaking animal. I mean, it's insane. Like, like I said, the 50 man Kumite, it's, uh, it's not a lot of people can finish that thing, you yeah. know? And, uh, and he did. And then this story, you know, coming with his heart, and you go, like, wow. And then not saying anything, just, you yeah. know, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. typical. That's, that's typical him. That's a fighter, you know? Never show what's on the on the inside, uh, but you never want to show it on the outside. Yeah, but it's like a sixth sense for some some athletes. It's like we just chalk it up to just it's part of the training, right? It's just part of the regime when you're feeling off. But something in there will tell you, I got to get to the doctor. I got to go to the hospital. Like we know where that point is. Some of us do. Yep. Yeah, we uh, had a trainer. We had a trainer no, in our gym, uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Ed was his name, and he. He just got unwell and uh, grabbed his chest and freaking died in the gym. Yeah, Hard it happens. Happen. It happens. Man, so sad. Yeah, so, um, so, so, boss and Sean, you're saying like these good, all these accolades and credits that Sam has. And yes, all of them. One thing that always stood out to me about him also is, you know, like like yourself, boss, and like Butterbean and, and Sean, now that I'm getting to know him, you guys all have this exterior and this reputation but mm -hmm. you're genuinely good people. And we, we don't always have that in our businesses. And we can talk about that another time. But yep. Sam always struck me as like, as tough as he was, as fearsome of reputation, yeah, just a good man. dude. Good yeah. dude, just like you guys. I guess, yeah. Gentlemen. It's a good segue into to next week's guest. I, I'm not going to be here. I'll be traveling uh, next week. But uh, Mick Foley, I've seen his story, right? And that is one... I'm really disappointed I won't be here to hear it because uh, I know he's a solid dude through and through, and he's been through it as well. Yeah, Mick, Mick, is, a great guy. Mick is a good guy. He's a guy. great guy, and he's a trip because, you know, he has this the facade of being the hardcore hero. Not a facade. I'm sorry, earned reputation True. of being the hardcore hero and doing the craziest stuff in pro wrestling ever, then playing these crazy characters, Cactus Jack and Mankind. And you think when you meet him, you're going to, like, meet this – Kind of like half yeah. half brain cretin, and yeah. he is truly one of the most intelligent human beings I've ever met and spoken with in my life. With with a memory like an elephant, it's unbelievable. And who's that? Boss? that is in the background, that is Mick Foley and Kevin James. Wow, Kevin James! Yeah, right. <laughs> it was skinny there. They were wrestling in school together for real. This is yeah. Mick Foley and Kevin James. How bizarre! Wow. Crazy, right? Yeah. I mean, Mick's got a lot of original footage when he was trying to get in, right? When he was trying to get into the business. Um, yeah. Reminds me of that, uh, Val Kilmer. Uh, he has a prime uh, television show called Val about his history, uh, about before he got the throat cancer or whatever. But he he literally willed his career into existence the way that Mick Foley did with wrestling. Documented yeah. everything. Yeah, yeah, Mick Mick very much did that, Sean, because especially at the time when he came in, 95% of a guy having a chance was built on having an ultimate warrior type of physique. Right. And Mick was <laughs> never approximated anything <laughs> like that. Yeah, and uh, he was just not what you would have looked at, uh, look for in a pro wrestler in those days. So yeah, yeah, he did he did will it into existence to well, become one of the biggest stars of all time. Watching next week's show from Switzerland. <laughs> well, man, I want to wish you safe travels and a successful yes. trip, man, for sure. And uh, Sean, I want to mention to you here pub, for public or what we're in the public. Um, I'm going to be in Los Angeles November 19th. Uh, Cameo is throwing a birthday party for me on Friday night, the 19th and uh, of November. I'm, I'm hoping you're going to be in town. Oh, you're going to be in Hawaii for your bodybuilding tournament. Oh, yes. <laughs> damn. I just. I'll be at uh, check in on the 19th in Hawaii while you're here. Two right seconds. as I was saying that, I'm like, he's going to be in Hawaii. That's yeah. right. Oh, well. Yeah. well. Hopefully, boss will show up. Take pictures. Okay. I'm going to do right my best, on. my buddy. 
Gonna be right, good. Guys, Should, be good. Guys. Should be good. Should be good. Should be good. Guys, it was uh good to see everybody. Anybody have anything that they uh need to get off their chest or want to say for uh sign off here this evening? I'm good, man. Yeah. I, I'm ready to eat. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to eat as well. I'm just uh, waiting for my goose. And, uh, and all I want to say for next week is Butterbean, don't talk so much, please. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <I'll> try not. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, I shut up. You know, great friends already. I mean, we've got a bond, and I appreciate y'all. All, all yeah, right, guys. Man. Me too, really man. cool. Me too. All right, guys. Have a nice evening, too. See you guys next week. Catch you on the following week. <laughs> Adios, guys. Cool. See you next week. <laughs> there we go. Godspeed, everybody. Ciao, bellos. Talking Tough, the world's toughest men and women at their most vulnerable. Join Rick, Sean, Boss, and Butterbean, plus very special guests live every Wednesday, 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific, right at Talking-Tough.com. You can also see him on YouTube at The Hannibal TV or Rick Bassman. You can check him out on Facebook at The Rick Bassman, The Real Sean Ray, and, of course, at Boss Bruton. Also, check out Rick on Twitter and Instagram at Rick underscore Bassman. Reminder, folks, Boss, Rick, Sean Ray, and Butterbean every Wednesday night live, 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific for Talking Tough.